目の前に立ちはだかる高い高い壁。So, for about three weeks in late December, early January, I binge watched a sports anime series. It started with my renewed love for the sport of volleyball, and with it came the need for quality volleyball content. Suffice to say, the show delivered and then some. Even if you don't watch anime or sports for that matter, give me a chance to tell you about this show first. Okay? Cool? Today, we're talking about Haikyuu. Haikyuu is a production IG anime series based off the shonen manga of the same name. It follows young volleyball hopefuls Hinata and Kageyama on their journey as they try to restore Karasuno High School back to its long gone days of championship glory. I myself have never watched a lot of anime, but this show had me hooked. I caught myself watching episode after episode, and before I knew it, I had finished up to season 3. That is 60 episodes in 3 weeks' time. So, where do I start with this show? First and foremost, I've always been a channel about film and TV analysis, but at a deeper level, it's always been about trying to understand how to tell stories better. And I think it's limited to say that anime is simply one genre, all animation in fact, because it can tell more than one type of story. I like to think of anime more as a medium for storytelling. While yes, there are art styles and conventions that are shared among anime. It can be used to tell so many different types of stories. I look to Haikyuu because I think its storytelling is extremely compelling, especially in the way it creates and captures action. Using Haikyuu, we're going to look at how sports stories can leverage animation in unique ways that make the action more engaging. When you go into an animated movie or TV show, your mindset shifts. Your brain makes sense of animation a little bit differently than it does live action, of course. You may be willing to suspend disbelief just a little more. You may be more forgiving of certain exaggerations or cliches, which then in turn affects how the story is allowed to be told. So, what do I mean? As a viewer, we expect the animation to behave in certain ways that we're not even consciously thinking about the timing, the physics, the framing, the emotion. Is all taken for granted by the viewer, but the animator has to pay careful attention to what they are doing so that it doesn't create dissonance between the audience's expectation and their animation. Essentially, what I'm saying is that there are principles for creating animation that is good, and those principles are. Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnston, in their 1981 book, The Illusion of Life, Disney Animation, codified 12 basic principles of animation so that animators can understand how to make more realistic animations. But it's almost a paradox to say that you're trying to make animation realistic, because if you were trying to truly make it real, then it would be live action. Rather, I think what these principles are trying to achieve is making animation feel dynamic, something that is living and breathing. Things in real life, for example, squash and stretch, but animation takes it a little further. The animated object will squash and stretch just a little more. People will anticipate or prepare themselves before they make a movement. They will coil up before they jump or sprint. But in animation, this anticipation is made just a little more stronger and noticeable. <laughs> So, you're not trying to imitate real life, but amplify it. And when it comes to sports, the idea of amplifying action helps to increase the intensity, the energy, and emotion in the story. We're going to take a look at two of the 12 basic principles timing and exaggeration, and examine how Japanese animation, specifically Haikyuu, employs their use. Let's start with how timing impacts action, because I think this one is huge. The timing principle specifically refers to the number of frames used for an action. If you depict an action in less frames, it will make it seem like it's moving faster. More frames will make it seem like it's moving slower. So, if you're trying to mimic real life movement, for example, a ball that is bouncing. As it falls, it will accelerate, and as it bounces back up, it will decelerate because it's fighting gravity. So you want to use less frames as the ball is falling, and then more frames as the ball is bouncing up because it's slowing down. You can see why, in a sports anime, understanding timing can be so important, especially when it comes to player and ball movement. 
For instance, this quick attack that Hinata and Kageyama use in the show does happen in real life games, where the spiker is in the air before the setter sets the ball. Just like in the show, the setter has to be quick enough to deliver it to the spiker, but animation perhaps delivers the intensity and drama just a bit better. In the clip I just played, the ball moves at lightning speed while Hinata is still floating through the air. One element in the frame is sped up, and the other is dramatically slowed down. It's essentially what would happen if it were live action, but it is given more emphasis through the lens of animation. Less frames for the ball, more frames for Hinata, makes Kageyama's set seem almost superhuman. There are many other instances where this technique is used, whether it be a player speeding past another player, or the ball slowing down and the player being fast enough to hit it. We can also talk about timing in more than just the number of frames. Pacing, for instance, is a huge aspect of timing. When people generally refer to pacing in film, they are referring to interscene pacing, which is the rate at which the story moves from scene to scene. Haiku is a little bit different because it's mainly focusing on intrascene pacing, the rate at which a single scene moves. This is because the largest focus of Haiku is of course on the games, these set pieces, which are technically one scene each, because they are in one place at one time. So how do we go about pacing a single scene? It sounds unusual because we usually think about a scene moving at the pace of real life. But just like a film, it needs to have dynamism. It needs to have moments that increase the rate so that it doesn't bore the viewer and then moments that slow down so it doesn't overwhelm them. How Haikyuu does this is by balancing fast in-game action with slower exposition. And no, I don't mean exposition in a bad way, it usually comes with a negative connotation, but I think the show works it in very creatively. Within its exposition, you are either learning something new, characters explain some of the rules of volleyball for those who don't know, or even more interestingly, it explains the game's strategies and tactics. The exposition can also set up and pay off the emotional moments of the story. You have flashbacks that set up character development for both protagonists and antagonists. Which is then paid off in the game. You have character reactions to gameplay, joy, fear, uncertainty. After Kageyama and Hinata land their first quick, the scene slows down, and we get precious seconds to cheer, applaud, cry, and yell. You have their constant analysis inside their heads that set up the next play. And just generally, the cutting of tension using humor. And then on top of all of that, the show weaves an interesting, fast-paced gameplay. Balancing these two elements can cause a game to last anywhere from half an episode to five episodes to, as demonstrated by season three, ten episodes, depending on the importance of the game and the stories that need to be told. I want to illustrate how the show paces a single moment, intra-scene, extremely well using one of my favorite moments from the series. The episode Guarding Your Back, Season 1, Episode 18, Asahi's rematch with Date Tech. It starts around the second set when Karasuno is up 22 to 20. The pace is fairly casual. Asahi is dealing with his mental block. He is still consistently struggling to get a spike past the iron wall. Karasuno gets a few points from Hinata when Aone, Detect's best blocker, rotates to the back row. Eventually, it's match point, but by now, Aone has rotated back to the front. Hinata is subbed off, and Asahi is there instead. The stage is set. The music picks up as Detect makes the serve. It goes back and forth quickly until Kageyama makes a set to Asahi. The scene slows down just a little. The pace picks up, the ball is blocked again, Nishinoya makes a save, and Asahi goes again. 
and it slows down a little more. As the ball is about to go directly down, we get into Nishinoya's thoughts, and everything slows down completely. The camera captures Asahi falling, Nishinoya's hands frozen, the ball gradually dropping to the floor, and then... The game speeds up again, but only by just a little. Asahi is prepared to go for another spike again. Kageyama gets in position. We hear multiple cries consecutively, and we get a flashback. Takeda is concerned. The rest of the team chants, one after the other. As opposed to simultaneously, the game effectively stops so we can build up to this moment. This one spike took about a minute of real time. The whole sequence took about five. You have the emotional weight of the story balancing out the speed of the game. While yes, in live action, you can incorporate things like slow motion, dramatic shots, and vary the pace of the game, but with anime, I think that there is a freedom and almost an expectation to have that timing distorted even further. There's more commentary, more thinking, more time to pause and reflect, more dramatic shots making the show dig deeper and have more intensity. When it comes to the 12 basic principles, exaggeration is probably the only one that doesn't strive for this concept of realism. The idea behind exaggeration is to actually make characters more of a caricature, so that they're not boring. If a character is happy, make them overtly happy. If a character is angry, you make them look like this. <laughs> Anime has probably the quintessential examples of exaggeration when it comes to storytelling. <laughs> In haiku, characters are constantly overthinking. They have the most pronounced facial reactions, the most emphatic cheers and dialogue and jokes that can make you cringe if you're watching it in dub. It can get pretty excessive, but despite it all, it doesn't take you out of the story. It actually makes you more invested. Why? Because exaggerations do a better job of showing rather than telling. Especially for emotions, characters can't simply state how they're feeling, so you're relying on things like facial and body language to convey emotion. In live action, you need good actors to be able to demonstrate emotion convincingly. But in animation, you can be more precise, more controlling, and show animation more directly because of how exaggerated you're allowed to be. <laughs> For instance, Oikawa's first appearance on the show, he struts in the music blares. It's already a little over the top, Everybody stares at him knowing that they're in trouble. As he makes his first serve, the background goes white, the animation becomes distorted, and this moment shows us a lot. It completely shifts the momentum of the game. It shows how skilled Oikawa is, how he can control the court, and also how fearful everyone is of him. <laughs> It's these dramatic moments that are amplified further through the use of exaggeration, the character reactions, the change of color of the backdrop. A setter dump, for instance, uncommon although standard play in volleyball seems like an unprecedented tactic in the show. Kageyama's one-handed set is godlike. Kanata's athleticism is unparalleled. And of course, it makes the wins and especially the losses even more riveting. The post game meal at the end of season one really hammers that home. You have the big globs of tears running down everybody's face as they consume extremely large mouthfuls of food. Yet, they sit in complete silence. From every drop of water, every streak of air, every backlit or toned down backdrop, it gives potency to every emotional moment. Let's also take a look at how the show exaggerates character type and personalities. A character like Asahi quitting volleyball because his spikes wouldn't go through is a bit much, but it really helps us get a deeper understanding of his character. 
he is soft to the point where he can be easily discouraged. But of course, as the ace, it makes the payoff to his development even sweeter. Kageyama is the epitome of selfishness and arrogance. He is that dictator. He is the king of the court. But then... Tsukushima is the most analytical. He is constantly thinking, constantly doubting. He is the most like a computer, emotionless and cold. But he has one of the best character arcs in the whole entire show. All their personalities are extreme in one way or another, but it makes their character development, their character arcs, that much more meaningful. Which brings me to... So to continue as I was saying, the show does a really great job at developing its characters, but not just because of this exaggeration piece alone. The show understands that every character needs an underlying weakness. John Truby states in his book, The Anatomy of Story, the weakness or need is what is holding the character back from succeeding. This is known as a psychological weakness. Hinata isn't skilled enough to hit a volleyball properly. Tsukushima is not passionate enough. Kageyama is too selfish, and the rest of the team, they're generally one-trick ponies with only one skill that they specialize in. In addition to these weaknesses, John Truby emphasizes the importance of moral need. That is, how is this one character's weakness holding back other people, not just themselves? In the premise of Haikyuu, it's actually very simple to develop moral need, because they all play on one volleyball team. One character's weakness will hurt the rest of the team's chances of winning. If Tsukushima doesn't want to keep improving, it puts pressure on the rest of the team to receive. If Kageyama continues to be selfish, the spikers will struggle. If Nishinoya can only bump receive, the setters will have to be relied upon more often. If Yamaguchi can't serve floaters, the team has fewer options when they need a pinch server. Understanding the moral and psychological need in Haikyuu is actually very simple, but it's very effective storytelling because now each of the characters have a weakness that they all work on to make the team better. This is why I love the Tokyo training camp arc. It was all dedicated to character development, and what's great is that the character development in the series never stops. Unlike a movie, a TV series tells a story for much longer, so you can't just simply have a character overcome their weaknesses once and then be done with it. If you look at Hinata, for example, his initial weakness was simply hitting balls and being good enough to play. As he got more of the basics down, his next weaknesses became his nervousness, and then his next weakness would be his inability to hit quick attacks with his eyes open and so forth. All the characters constantly push themselves to overcome weakness after weakness, striving to improve themselves, learn new skills and techniques. <laughs> Which brings me to my last question. What is the theme of the show? There's a few, but to me, the show is about ambition. I've talked about ambition previously before on this channel, specifically with one other show, link to it to the card on the top right here. That show actually has a very conflicting view of the effects of ambition, in that it can actually affect you negatively. Haikyuu, on the other hand, has a very resolute view of ambition, in that ambition is deemed as a necessity. In one of the episodes, it even compares ambition as equal and constant as the drive to fulfill hunger. And this is even symbolized in their actions, as when a character competes or a character is driving for something more, pushing themselves, they lick their lips. In the show, characters can only thrive when they constantly push themselves to be better. But even then, no matter how high you climb, sometimes it's not enough. The hunger will always be there because the development never stops. I also commend its show for the consistency in which it treats this theme. There's no random filler episode that derails the show. There's no random, unexpected change of character motivation. Every storyline, every side story, 
goes back to the main goal, winning at volleyball. They strive to improve so that they can win. They win so that they can advance, and advance so hopefully one day they can become national champions. This anime is just so well put together. You can see how the use of animation to tell the story influences the set pieces and the in-game action. It also flows into the character arcs. We see how exaggerated their personalities are, and we can see the development that comes out of that. Haikyuu is really a testament to how animation is not just a single genre, but a medium that can be leveraged to tell stories in unique and interesting ways. Thanks for watching. Happy New Year, everyone. I hope you've all had a fantastic start to 2020. This is the first video out of the new year. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, first, I want to say thank you to all my subscribers. I'm at 5K now, and I'm just blown away. I don't even know what to say. Just thank you so much. I never thought I would make it this far. If you are new here, please consider subscribing. I make video essays on all things storytelling that I find interesting. Um, and please keep recommending me content to watch. I'll add it to the list and one day maybe I'll make a video about it. So um, yeah, that's uh, all I'm going to say. Uh, don't forget to like and comment um, and expect more videos coming out in the future. Uh, I'll catch you guys next time. Bye.